Moises' wish is Tomas and I's command. Today on the docket, instead of reviewing the blood money pay-per-view from last week, you guys voted in the greatest pay-per-view of all time. And I cannot thank you guys enough for uh, voting this in because Tomas and I were just talking about this and both of us just couldn't help but smile reliving this thing. So oh, good. yes. So instead of making ourselves feel terrible, we're going to make ourselves feel good. And if you are dying, dying, dying to know our opinions on Crown Jewel, wow. uh, my 15-second review, it was actually a decently good show. It was. Uh, it was a decently good show. If you really need to go out of your way to watch something, watch Edge and Rollins and Hound in yes. a Cell. And you know what? Watch the triple threat match for the SmackDown Women's Championship. And if you really want to watch it, I think Reigns and Lesnar had the best match they've ever had. Really? So, that's better, my review in a nutshell. Better than our main um, event that we got? Oh, I might yeah. be a little I bit was, biased. I might be a little I, bit biased. I, uh, 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 I would take this Reigns over a green Roman Reigns any yeah. day. Well, um, that's also, true. That's true. Yeah. Also, without getting into it too much, I just don't like how WWE fucking worships that place. Uh, so I'm glad we're not talking about it because I don't want to join in the, the boot licking. Same. Same. Well... I mean, other than the fact that Edge and Rollins had my personal favorite match of the year in WWE inside Hell in a Cell, like, I hate that it was at Crown Jewel and not at yeah. some other show. But Again, if you really need to go out of your way to watch something, it's the first match on the show. Yeah. Watch it. It, honest to God, had That's a WrestleMania feel to it. It's oh, so, so good. But speaking of WrestleMania, WrestleMania X7, 2001, April 1st the granddaddy of them all, the greatest WrestleMania of all time, the greatest pay-per-view of all time. And if you want to know why I think that, and I'm sure Tomas, I don't know if I could speak for him, but do you think this is the greatest mania of all time? It's definitely up there. It is the most successful WrestleMania of all time. Back in the Attitude sure Era, is. this had more buy rates than any pay-per-view of that time. And I don't want to speak for modern manias, but I do think this is probably buy rate-wise the greatest wrestlemania of all time yeah and, and also base. they they benefited from uh purchasing their competition like six days beforehand wcw six went days. down the toilet yeah wcw went down the toilet so a lot of their fans were just kind of like you know like beat from the stupid like the stupid they were jaded. that they had yeah so they uh they would go on and they would purchase wwf wrestlemania x7 and then they became fans again i'm sure but, yeah uh, let's rip that band-aid off right now the WCW defects were sitting in the nosebleeds for this pay-per-view, just basically watching. <laughs> Imagine having a job at a very successful wrestling oh, company, and then a God. week later, again, you're in the nosebleeds watching the competition because you're technically employed by them now. Yep, uh, technically. We'll, technically. More had, on that later. <laughs> more on that later. Yeah, we'll get to that. But, uh, yeah, if you want to know why this is the greatest pay-per-view of all time, in my eyes, definitely continue watching on. And go check out some of Tomas and I's other uh, rants and podcasts that we have. We're doing wrestling every single month over here. Hit that subscribe button if you're new to the channel. I, of course, talk about movies all the time over here, too. Uh, and hit that thumbs up button as well, because there's going to be a lot of uh, fun memories to uh, go down here. But uh, WrestleMania X7 takes place in the Reliant Astrodome in Houston, Texas, which honestly, such an iconic building. Um, it was actually the uh, building that held the climax of the sequel to Bad News Bears. I don't know if you knew that, but uh, the let them play scene with uh, Kelly Leak and his dad running out there. That was in the Astrodome. So, oh, yeah. Um, and a little, this is this, this show was very fitting because later on in 2009, WWE would go on to host WrestleMania 25 in this same building. And here we are. Same building? Next, uh, I at thought the Astrodome. Was, uh, no, it was, uh, no, it, the Astrodome, I think, was closed around that time. They went to the Texans. Was it? Yeah, they went to the Texan Stadium. And the Texans, I know it was in Houston. It was in yeah. Texas Stadium. Yeah, they it was in have, Texas okay, Stadium. Okay, okay. Yeah. And the, okay. I know that and also, uh, I know that the Texans did not become a team until like the year after Mania X Seven. So okay, I, mean, I could okay. be wrong about this. So it's but yeah, the full circle. Uh, we were just talking about how WrestleMania is going to be in Dallas next year, and the logo looks just like the Mania Twenty Five one, which was also in Houston. <laughs> sure does, and it's so, two nights, two nights of WrestleMania. But uh, this is yeah, for sure the greatest one night of wrestling I think that's ever going to be put to the screen. Like, and I don't think anything's ever going to come close to it. AEW All Out this past September was damn, damn close. But uh, 
no, nothing, nothing touches WrestleMania X7 for me. There's just way too many memories of it. I've watched that VHS tape so many times. I still have the DVD on my shelf over here on another side of my room. A very, very rare DVD to find these days for sure. But uh, oh yeah, in any uh, case. So we open up this show with Chris Jericho defending his Intercontinental title against William Regal. Yes, I want to talk about the bill for this match right now because. I don't want to... Okay, you know what? Fine. The nostalgia goggles are going to be tight for this review, yeah. even though this was a year prior to me watching wrestling. Watching this hype package, you know, WWE just had... Or WWF, I should say, just had a better mindset when it came to booking these views. This yeah. is an opening mid-card match for the Intercontinental title, and they booked it so perfectly. What's the story to this? Regal's the commissioner of the Such WWF. Such an underrated Jericho. Dude. Yeah, Jericho just decided to come out one night on Raw and absolutely fuck with Regal. So what does Regal do? He abuses his power. He mm-hmm. forces Jericho to fight right to center four on one. He forces Jericho to fight the Dudley Boys in a table match two on one. Jericho retaliates by literally pissing in Regal's tea. <laughs> you know, if, if <laughs> this, loved it. this fucking loved this it. This would have been a throwaway feud in today's day and age, and Jericho mm-hmm. and Regal probably would have wrestled six times on Raw prior to this WrestleMania. But the fact that WWE held this title match off to Mania and actually built the feud in other ways, again, Regal's the commissioner. He's going to force Jericho in all these handicapped situations just to torture him. And again, Jericho's going to fuck with this guy. It was yeah. such a simple but perfect build, and, you know. And Regal giving himself an intercontinental title match, you know, clearly abusing his power. And, like, you know, Paul Heyman, who is JR's uh, color commentator on this night, just fresh off of ECW's bankruptcy, uh, he calls William Regal a very physical commissioner. That's exactly what he is. That's exactly oh, yeah. what he is. Abusing his power, you know? Like, but this was, I mean, this was, it was a good opener. I really enjoyed it. Very reminiscent of Regal's match that he would have with Van Dam the next year. Um, didn't get a whole lot of time, but they Isn't certainly this squeezed a Jericho's- lot in first wrestlemania no it's uh number two number second two. second that's yeah. right that's right that's right he won the european title in that stupid uh, two fall triple threat match at mania 2000 so uh um, the euro continental title yes yeah the we can euro never forget continental that. title who can never ever forget, forget that. the two fall triple threat match but um such an underrated feud jericho is selling his left shoulder because regal had him in the regal stretch on smackdown and he aggravated that shoulder uh, Jericho was selling it throughout the duration of this match. And I thought that was excellent psychology. Uh, even though Jericho did hit a top rope Judas effect before he popularized it 20 years later on Regal early on. <laughs> I <laughs> noticed that. Like, damn. <laughs> yeah, top rope Judas effect. You know, love that move. It looked so crisp even back in 2001. Jericho's Little did Jericho know he'd be using a spinning back elbow as his finisher again 20 years later. <laughs> Jericho, such a pioneer of the business. This man does not age. I'm convinced he does not age. He looks like I I don't know how old Jericho was at this juncture, but he yeah, very very long storied career for this gentleman. Uh Regal exposes the uh top turnbuckle at some point. Referee Tim White makes no attempts to put the turnbuckle pad back on. He makes no attempts to disqualify the commissioner, which will be a – you'll notice that it's kind of a trend through this show. The uh, exposed steel, the exposed turnbuckle, you know, they don't try to disqualify wrestlers for doing that. But uh, it's definitely – you know, Regal throws Jericho into it a few times. Uh, there is an avalanche underhook suplex by Regal, a superplex, and I was like – God, so good. So, so good. And then Jericho tried to lock on the walls a few times, but notice that he does not lock on the walls at one point, at any point during this opener. Not once. He tried to, but his shoulder gave way. And then Regal would capitalize. He locked on the Regal stretch. It was at that point I noticed Regal's mouth was bleeding all over the place. All over. Very, very physical matchup this was. Just a true testament to it. But then what happens, Chris Lash rule comes into effect. William Regal goes headfirst into the exposed buckle, the one he introduced into the match. And Jericho hits a lion salt to retain the title. Uh, two and three quarter stars. Solid opener. But oh, yeah. Could have been even better with more time, I think. Oh, yeah. Definitely agree with you there. Two, two and three quarter stars. It's, again, this is just a fun little feud. And, you know, a fun feud and fun wrestling to kick off this wrestling pay-per-view. Wrestling, uh, you know. Yep. 
again, I would trade all the glitz and the glamour for just, you know, some solid wrestling at the beginning of the show. Not saying WWE doesn't do that nowadays, but, you know, I prefer the substance over the style. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And this match was definitely more substance than anything. William Regal took an absolute beating in this match. I feel like we've said this a million times on these pods, but I am convinced that Regal is the greatest wrestler to never win a world championship because he put his body on the line at lots of points. Oh, absolutely. He was so technically sound. And if you love this feud, I highly encourage anyone who has Peacock, go to the next pay-per-view, Backlash 01. (laughs) Where Jericho and Regal would have a queen, uh, the Duchess of Queens. What was it? What was it? The Duchess of Queensbury, <laughs> the Duchess of Queensbury rules match, where yes, the rules just kept is. changing on Chris Jericho. You know what? That Loved was it. something totally stolen from WCW. But considering oh, yeah. it was a Lance Storm thing, I'm pretty sure Lance Storm gave Regal his blessing to take that kind of concept. Oh yeah. If anyone for remembers sure. the Canadian rules match, it was basically every time Regal was going to lose, he'd get pinned. But the Duchess would wave off the rule, wave off the bell and say, no, 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 no. In a Duchess of Queensbury match, you you have to win with a five count, not a three yeah. count. So the match would restart. <laughs> and then Regal would tap out. And then, the, the, no, 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 no. In a Duchess of Queensbury, it's two out of three falls. So the match would yep. keep restarting and restarting. Or, oh, no, 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 no. There's no disqualifications in a Duchess of Queensbury match. It's yep. a very, very fun Loved concept it. that definitely only benefits the heel. But... Again, I encourage anyone who has Peacock, go watch Backlash 01. The yeah. fun just continues with this feud. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it doesn't stop there, for sure. And Backlash 01 might be another topic for another time, just because that match is so outlandishly ridiculous, you know? But in any case, great opener, but the fun just continues, because next up, you have a fun little, what seems like a filler six-man tag team match, but... Not really. I mean, you have the Acolyte Protection Association, the Acolytes, the APA, are teaming up with color commentator for SmackDown, Taz, former ECW champion, mind you. They're going up against Right to Censor, one of the most despicable heel acts in the lower mid-card around the end of the Attitude Era. This was a spoof of the parent television council who was going after the WWF at the time for their risque product. So this was Vince McMahon's method to uh, fire back. You can call it petty all you want, but the right to center was hilarious. They had their opening. I also so annoying. It was just a siren everywhere. I couldn't stand them when I was a kid. Couldn't um, stand them. So also you want to take into account who's in this faction. Bull Buchanan, a trash talking Italian, the Mm -hmm. Godfather. He was a pimp who was nicknamed, renamed the good father. Here he in sure right center. Val Venus, who is a porn star, and Steven Richards, <laughs> former ECW star, who yep. used to smash people's heads in with steel chairs and bleed all over the place. This is this faction. And just for the sake, they abducted Ivory. Ivory, yep. the spunky little girl that everybody used to love backstage. She, I forgot how she ended up, but she did lose a match. Or somebody, I think, no, no, Jerry Lawler lost a match to Steven Richards in her behalf. Was yeah. That, am I correct? I think it was, it was either, Lawler. you know what? I think they kidnapped the cat who was Jerry Lawler's wife at the time. And they did that. That's right. And, and I, I think no, Ivory. Thank you, thank you, thank you for reminding me. Yeah, I think Ivory willfully joined the right to censor because she mm-hmm. agreed with what. Thank uh, you, but I do remember that storyline where Lawler did lose it for the cat. She had to force the join, but then yep. Lawler and cat. Thankfully, got fired from the WWF, and they just scrapped the whole Shit. fucking thing. Um, <laughs> thank you for recharging my, uh, my my yeah. foggy memory there. That was but that. Uh, was... Yeah, that was at No Way Out the month before, which is another excellent pay per view from two thousand one. But uh, yeah, um, definitely, definitely a fun. Dare fun I say, match. RTC would work perfectly in twenty twenty one. Yes, because in twenty twenty one, you dare say that people feel like they have the right to censor everybody else's opinions Mm -hmm. so you definitely and they are kind of doing something like this with joe gacy and nxt nxt halloween hobbit yeah cheap plug there we we will be reviewing that show and we'll go into more into gacy in that show but you know with the whole the politically correct this was political correctness back then with rtc i think if wwe wanted to give rtc another shot here in 2021 I think it worked perfectly because it's such an easy concept to hate. 
It really, it really is, and it would get so many boos from people. Like, oh yeah, all over the place. Also, what was the attitude era? Blood and swear words and boobies and naked women and naked men. Mark yep. Center basically came out and said, "No fun, no naked women, you can't no have swearing, fun. no blood." And you know, it's easy to hate. Nobody yeah. likes the party pooper. No. No, of course not. For some reason, like, yeah, like their rule book, like it feels like they would have a PowerPoint presentation. It just makes me think that Drew Gulak would be the leader of Right to Censor in today's day and age. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, nobody liked so the well. kid in school that reminded the teacher that they had homework the night before. That's what Right to Censor are. No drinking. And the <laughs> APA takes exception to this. Bradshaw is in his home state, which, by the way, like, if you look at Bradshaw's face from, like, back in old 2000, 2001 WWF, it's the same guy. He looks exactly the same. But, you know, oh, yeah. he would come to have my hair around 2003. So, hey, that's your father enough. you're talking about. You show respect to him. A wrestling god. You know? <laughs> but... In any case, uh, this is way before that. We're we're getting ahead of ourselves. But uh, Bradshaw does drop a bunch of weird Texan sports references uh, in the APA's office, which I've never understood still to this day. But it's pretty much a massive chaos, and it's, you know, it's fun. There's heat on Taz getting beat up by the good father, not the godfather. It's so weird for me to say the good father these days because, like, I don't know. Um, I have a question for you, though, Tomas, because uh, the good father was hitting what used to be known as the hoe train a couple of times in this. What would the hoe train be called if he's not a pimp? Don't you dare say the no train. Other than that. <laughs> other than that. What would it be called, Zach? I don't you know. I don't know. That's why I was asking you. <laughs> I, I, I'm stumped. <laughs> I don't I know. Have 100% stuck. Stuck. I don't know what else to call it, but like the whole train, it's like it's always what it's been called. But like, if he's the good father, if he's not a pimp, he can't be doing the whole train, you know. But it's um, kind of weird. It's kind of like when Kofi Kingston transitions to the new day, but he still calls his finisher Trouble in Paradise. Like I yeah. thought he dropped the Jamaican gimmick a long time ago, but I guess it sounds better than spinning roundhouse kick. Yeah, yeah, it just rolls off the tongue better, I guess. Trouble in Paradise, but. uh yeah, but eventually you get to the point where Bradshaw is tagged in. There is a huge avalanche back superplex on Val Venus, who was folded up like an accordion in JR's words. That was one of his favorite phrases back then. Um, but then it comes down to Bradshaw and the good father who misses the hoe train. And Bradshaw damn near takes this poor guy's head off with a clothesline from hell. And uh, yeah, Bradshaw, of course, gets the Duke in his home state. Stevie Richards is throwing a bitch fit on the outside because his guy's lost. But I mean, was there any doubt who was winning if they're in oh, Texas yeah. and Bradshaw's in the ring? Like, come on, come on now. But also, this would continue to not be a good night for right to censor. More on that later. More, more later for sure. But yes, this is definitely, I mean, fun for what it was. It's a two star match. It's definitely very physical and uh, certainly not the uh, most memorable match on this card. I give it a star and a half because it, it didn't even make the four minute mark. It, it was there. It was what it was. It was nothing bad. Yeah. I'm happy to say, especially from the mania prior to this one, there is no thrown together throwaway bullshit on this show. This was a right. fun six man tag. There's no, again, there was every, everyone, you know, it's funny how everyone calls mania 2000, the worst WrestleMania of all time, because there was only one one on one match. Not one one on one match, and it was a freaking evening gown pillow fight. I think it was still better than WrestleMania 11. Still better than 11. Oh, so, <laughs> just saying, just saying, but uh, more on that later. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> Maybe another cool. topic for another time, but uh, yeah, and the fun continues because we have a match that is very infamous, in my opinion, oh, for all the wrong reasons. So excited! We so have excited. Kane. <laughs> Big Show and Raven in a triple threat match for the Hardcore Championship. Oh, my God. The Hardcore Championship, the original 24-7 championship in the WWF. Literally, um, Tomas, this is, like, legit one of my favorite matches to rewatch growing up. I'm so excited to discuss this with you. I adore to, this match. To quote my so lovely fun. girlfriend, this is a turn-off-your-brain kind of match where <laughs> yeah. don't think about it too much. Don't 
try to make it realistic and you will have a lot more fun with oh, this absolutely. match. Absolutely. You have a freaking demon from hell, Kane, coming out there challenging for a hardcore title, which, by the way, at this point, this is like peak Kane at this point in his career. He was fucking jacked. He looked scary walking out to the ring. Like the lighting on his face was just like no expression in his mask this time. It was pitch perfect Kane. But you also have a freaking giant who used to be billed as Andre the Giant's fake son in WCW. But then you also have freaking Raven who used to lead a cult back in ECW. You want to talk about underrated freaking Raven. We don't talk about him enough. I freaking loved this guy. Uh, he comes out with a shopping cart filled with goodies to freaking bash you know, his opponents with. Yeah, I'm going to have a hot take. Raven's biggest mistake in his career was leaving ECW for WCW. Yeah. Because once he would leave ECW, I felt like it was just all unfortunate, unfortunate downhill from him. But yeah. this was one of the bright spots in his WWF run. I know Raven hated being in the WWF. But I'm glad we had, you know, a little spark here and there. And, and this right. was one of them. This yeah. was one of them. And he also holds the record for uh, most hardcore title reigns, too, with, I believe, 26, I want to say. Not to say that that's saying a whole lot, because 26 hardcore title reigns is like saying you have 53 24-7 title runs, R-Truth. Like R-Truth? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, getting his baby back. But at least, you know, Raven's not making like a whole mockery of it. He's trying to like, you know, take it seriously. But uh Kane and Raven start to fight as Big Show's music hits. Um <laughs> so they're they're just having their own little mini match as Big Show is making his big mania entrance. You know, then, it's a hardcore title match, so who cares? Why do we have to wait for Big Show to make his entrance? Let's start fighting cares? now. You know, there's <laughs> chaos in this match from the very beginning. Kane is flying to the outside, hitting Big Show with his trademark flying clothesline that he always does. Fucking Kane was the MVP of this match. I don't care what anybody says. This guy, like, he looks like a million bucks compared to Raven and the Big Show. You know, oh, he does. Not to discredit them, because I think both of them played their role to perfection. And we'll get to Big Show. I know you want to talk about how funny he was in this match, but Raven played his role perfectly. Paul Heyman, who I'm sure had a lot of creative say in Raven's ECW run, he only had one thing to say about Raven's strategy. Run like hell. When you're going up against Kane and the Big Show for your championship, yeah, you better run like hell. But you better make sure you swoop in and take up, take up the scraps and get the pin. But... Um, everybody was doing their roles perfectly. There was a bunch of chaos in the crowd, which, you know, could not have been fun being a security guard that night. Um, I don't envy those guys one bit, but they eventually spill backstage. And this is where the match gets awesome for me. Big show slams Kane on some pallets, leads Raven into like a caged area. And it was at this point where I was like, has Big Show learned nothing from watching Kane? But like padlocking a door will only hold Kane back for so long. Because he's the original horror movie monster. Of course he's yes. gonna find his way out. Look at look at this damn shirt. It looks like a horror movie monster. Kane Opening was the, the Michael Myers of the World Wrestling Federation. Yes. You can't kill him. Yes. He won't stay down. <laughs> he will rip doors open. He will set you on fire. You know, if you set him on fire, he will come back. You know, and how he debuted in the Federation was he ripped the cage door off Hell in a Cell, you know, so Big Show has learned nothing in character. Like, again, turn, yeah, turn your brain off. Yeah, exactly. Off. Kane breaks off the padlock and then he throws Raven through a glass window. Fucking gruesome. And Raven's shoulder was bleeding all over the fucking place. He, Raven was, poor Raven was abused in this thing. Like, he was thrown, thrown through plate glass windows, chucked through chain link fences, like, moments before the window spot, which drew a huge reaction from the crowd. But. Yeah. So K Kane and Big Show start rolling up and doing their thing. Spot number one that I really love. <laughs> Kane has, no, Big Show has Kane. Set up for the choke slam. He does his whole, oh, and then Kane just chokes him back. <laughs> Knocks and the Kane look, to the door. <laughs> and the look on Show's face. And then the so spot great. that we were all waiting for. Just by tapping the wall, Big Show and Kane go creeping through the fucking wall. Oh, yeah, of course. You know, because why, like, what other reaction would you have had? Kareem through a wall, Big Show and Kane. Um, 
and, so and you funny. know, I'm sitting here thinking because they knock everything down. I'm like, I feel bad for the poor schmuck who has to clean this up. And then right. Raven comes back out of nowhere. He picks up a fucking folding table and just throws it on the big show. Yeah. Face. Oh, yeah. You know, that takes strength to do that. You know, <laughs> again, give Raven credit where it's due. But then we get to perhaps the most infamous thing about this whole show. Raven commandeers a golf cart. Big Show gets in the back seat of the golf cart. He's choking Raven, and Raven tries to, like, swerve in the hallway with the golf cart. I guess the whole idea was Kane was going to chase them out in the other golf cart, and they were going to end up back in the arena somehow. But Raven kind of lost control, and uh, the golf cart careens into the wall, and it ends up hitting – if you go with, back and watch the feed on Peacock, you'll notice that there is a very thick wire that's almost pulled clean off. I guess that was the feed to the pay-per-view and Raven was like a quarter inch away from cutting off the feed to the whole show, which, you know, could you have imagined that? Yeah. Millions of people at home probably would have fucking raged. Mm -hmm. (laughs) If the pay-per-view, I I, thank God it didn't happen because the cable company would have had phone calls of the ass from angry wrestling fans ordering what the fuck happened to WrestleMania. Right, exactly. The, only the live people would know what was going on for the show. But uh, then <laughs> then what happens is Kane, they improvise and Kane gets in a golf cart of his own with the referee. He runs Raven clean over. Or at least what tries to. Yeah. He runs over his butt well, at least. He ran over like the back of his leg, like his hamstring <laughs> or something like that. Like it was like before fucking uh, Sammy Guevara made being run over by a golf cart famous in 2020. But uh, yeah, there's a point where they're fighting through the uh, through the hallway and then Raven goes into the concessions area and he knocks over JR's favorite Snapple all over the floor. Um, whoever drinks Snapple anymore. Like other than Jim Ross, <laughs> what a what a what a damn heel Raven is! What a what a piece of shit he is! <laughs> what a spilling piece the of snapple, shit. spill the snapple all over the floor after you almost cut off the feed to the show. You know, like you can't you can't win them all. But uh, basically, yeah, they go back out to the stage. They're fighting there for a little bit. Big Show has Raven in a gorilla press over his head, which is a massive feat of strength. Uh, Kane being the monster that he is, big boots show, and both guys go careening off the stage. And apparently the stage was filled with, like, smokestacks in there. Like, again, I really had to turn my brain off for this one and not really think too much about it. And just Yeah, like, and then just to add the exclamation point, just because Kane fucking jumps off the stage. Yeah, <laughs> he, he, he jumps off the stage and JR calls it a leg drop, even though it looked nothing like a leg drop. No, and then Heyman has to justify it after the match just by saying Kane wanted to make sure Big Show was going to stay down. (laughs) Just for shits and giggles, but Kane pins the Big Show with that move and he becomes the hardcore champion. Entertainment Or did he pin Raven? Because I remember JR making a point saying Kane made sure to pin Raven, not Big Show. Because apparently this is the only triple threat match in existence where you have to pin the champion Oh, no, in order no, Raven, to win the title. Raven was the champion. Raven was the champion. Yeah. Raven, so Kane didn't pin him? No, but Kane, Kane pinned the Big Show. Kane okay, the okay. Big show for sure. So, um, and the referee had such a weird angle counting it up against the wall, too. It was counting it sideways. I was like, what the fuck, man? But, I mean, entertainment-wise, this is for sure five stars. I will rewatch this shit all the time. But, I mean, technically, fuck this it, is... five stars. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I, I wasn't being serious there. Technically, this Ugh. is like, th- technically, this is like three and a half stars. But, like... In terms of like entertainment, you know what? Value, I can't rate. I can't rate this match. I'm gonna rate it entertaining as fuck. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a two thumbs up for me. For sure, <laughs> it's definitely you know something I'll rewatch again and again and again, millions of times more. Definitely it, one of the a, better. It, <laughs> it's a cold classic. One of it's the better. One of the better hardcore title matches out there, and that's a great way to describe it. I never even thought of it that way, but yeah, it's a cold classic. I love it. Tomas it's, loves it. I'm sure there's a the bunch most of other people out there that love infamous it. Infamous hardcore title match in history, next to, uh, next to the whole Holly debacle. Was that the year prior? Mm, that where was... Crash was supposed to lose the title, the hardcore 
Yep. But yep, Bob the didn't pay him royal. in time. Hardcore battle. So royal. unfortunately, yep. Crash retained the title when he wasn't supposed to. Yep. Yep. I remember that. <laughs> Fucking A, man. But yeah, super entertaining. Uh, speaking of, we cut to the backstage area after Kane celebrates his victory. We come backstage to former WWF champion Kurt Angle, who just lost his title the month before. And he's wrestling Chris Benoit on this card uh, later, later on the show. But backstage, we uh, basically... Can I just say for a second? Behind. Yeah. 01 and 02, Angle really got the short end of the stick right before WrestleMania. Yeah. He had to drop the title to The Rock this year. And then the next year, we have the whole, you know, he won Triple H's title match at No Way Out just to lose it right back to him the night after. Yep. So it's just like, it's a good thing Angle stuck around with WDF, WWF because if oh, they exactly. would have done this in modern times, he would have been dead in the water. It, uh, no, he would have jumped ship to AEW. So um, <laughs> like he, that's what he would have done. But uh, Kurt Angle basically is rewinding the tape that Benoit had him in the crossface and Angle's tapping out ferociously. And he's like, he never officially made me tap. So it never happened. And he's in such fierce denial. His friends, Edge and Christian, are sitting there and they're like, you know, joking around with him and they're pulling his legs. And he's in no no mood for uh, joking around at this point. So very, very serious business. But more on that later. Up next is Tess defending the European Championship against Eddie Guerrero, who is accompanied by Perry Saturn and the fuzziest hat you will ever see in your fucking life. Like, what the hell? Perry Saturn looks like Perry Saturn looks like reality star Hulk Hogan. Oh yeah. You know? Um thankfully this is way before Moppy. This is way before Saturn yeah. totally lost his mind oh, yeah. on Monday Night Raw. This was this still, is still like, radicals. This, yes, this was still the radicals, minus Chris Benoit, who is busy. Um, but Eddie Guerrero honestly really does not get enough credit for how good he was in this match. And likewise for Tess, we'll get to, but like Eddie was bumping like crazy for this guy, trying to make him look as amazing as he possibly could Tess was the champion going into this um i know we were talking a lot about this last night but how many times did wwe have to drop the ball on Tess? like so many times and these retrospectives are just making me so making it so apparent like even prior to this Tess was supposed to be stephanie's kayfabe husband they yep. scrapped that Tess was you know the mid-card workhorse of wwf they scrapped that. They, you know, so many times, like, you could have put him in a world title feud there. You could have had him win the Royal Rumble there. You yeah. could have had him, you know, they cut his hair and changed his music and changed his whole persona in 2002. They didn't do it there. Yes, I'm going to jump the gun right now. They brought him back in 2007 as a fucking monster. Yeah. Put him on ECW, and they failed there. Like, mm -hmm. I don't get it. I feel like Test... In Vince's eyes, should be the guy. He has it. He is almost a total package. He's got the look. You know, a little shaky on the mic, but he really made up bit. for it in the ring. Really, really good. And he honestly was pulling out moves that I never remember Tess ever hitting. Tess also hit an avalanche Judas effect early on in this thing. And I was like, what the hell? Tess hit a Judas effect? Like, good lord. You know, the spinning back elbow. Um, but then there was a point in the match where this is just this just goes to show you how professional Eddie Guerrero was looking out for his opponent. Uh, Tess unfortunately ends up getting stuck in the in the ropes by his foot, and he's dangling there upside down. The referee is trying his damnedest to get Tess out of the ropes, doesn't have the strength to do it. So Eddie Guerrero looking out for Tess, um, he basically opens up the ropes for him, lets Tess fall to the ground, and then they continue. And they continue. And uh, they played it up on commentary. They were like, oh, Eddie realizes he can't win the title this way, which I think is actually brilliant. You know, it's not. Oh, really, yeah. You know, it's not exactly throwing, you know, oh, this is fake. And Eddie's actually looking out for his opponent. And they're teaming up yeah. in this context. But um, fucking ouch, though, for Tess. I, I felt so bad for him in that moment. Good Lord. But 
Um, the crowd, <laughs> the crowd did pop for Eddie saving Tess at that point because they were like, "Yay, more match!" And yeah, exactly. They they didn't take it home early. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. We uh we get more match, and it was actually really good. Tess hits a beautiful tilt a whirl slam on Eddie. Tess almost hits what looks like a blue thunder bomb on Eddie Guerrero, which looked really really good. Um, but Eddie. Eddie, that rap scallion, of course, has to lie, cheat, and steal his way. He low blows Tess. Um, he's getting Perry Saturn involved. And I actually did write down what Paul Heyman called the move that Perry Saturn hit on Tess when the ref was distracted. The moss-covered family Gradunzel. That's what it is, oh JR. <laughs> you know? I think that was one of uh, Chris Jericho's 1,004 holes from WCW. Yes. The moss-covered family Gradunzel. And I was like, I thought that was some made up shit, but apparently Perry Saturn hit one. But um, Eddie Guerrero does hit an impressive brain buster, which keep in mind, Test is not a small man. So no. the fact that Eddie Guerrero got him up for a brain buster is pretty damn impressive. Um, Test then hits another pump handle slam. Perry Saturn gets involved. Big boots of Saturn. And did you hear the snap when Eddie took the big boot? Oh, God damn. So Echoed throughout the stadium. It almost... It almost reminded me of a Claymore in a lot of ways. You know, Tessa does honestly feel like, honestly, he reminds me a lot of Drew McIntyre in this phase. Like, he has that kick as a finisher. I mean, he's not as good on the mic as Drew McIntyre is. But, uh, I mean, it's very, very similar style of offense. And I'm like, how come Vince didn't pull the trigger on this guy if he's reminding exactly. me so much of Drew, you know? You, <laughs> like, again, Test had almost everything, and I feel like his weaknesses, they definitely could have worked around, but it's a mystery. It's a mystery why WWF never pulled the trigger on Test. They never did, but uh, yeah, Test hits another big booty, goes for the pin. Dean Malenko, the third radical, pulls him off the pin, and then he's like, yeah, I did it! You know, and he's jaw jacking with the crowd. Test is picking him up by the head, and the expression on Malenko's face is something I'll never forget. Malenko looked horrified when Tess freaking grabbed it by the throat. And I'm like, good Lord, man. Malenko, again, that's a that's another wrestler who I'm sure we could talk about in other pods. But God damn, he was just so, so good in the ring. And WWF never really fully utilized him. No. Potential you want some so. good Malenko matches? Again, pull up that Peacock. Pull up any WCW pay-per-view from the mid-90s. And again, it the demand is there. We would love to look at a WCW pay-per-view. Yes, yes, absolutely, for sure. So, uh, <clears throat> I mean, not, you know, not to jump the gun, of course, but I love, I love the fact that we put the poll out there and this is the show that was selected. But yeah, WCW shows, I'm game to talk about those too. But in all seriousness, Eddie Guerrero does hit the belt shot. Perry Saturn tossed the European title belt to him and Eddie fucking steals one as he always did. He becomes the new WWF European champion. Great match. Three and a quarter stars for me. This is a lot better than I remembered it. Oh, yeah. And, you know, if I'm going to nitpick anything, a little overbooked to a finish. But at the same time, the Radicals oh, yeah. are dirty heels. They're trying to protect Test here, surprisingly. So a lot of dirty shit to get this victory. And Eddie is your new European champion. He sure is. And he wouldn't hold the belt for long. I believe he'd lose it a few days later to Matt Hardy, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then I think would, so, yeah. But then they would have a weird triple threat match the next month with Matt Hardy, Eddie Guerrero, and Christian for the European title. Weird combination because yeah, again, two, this is two the tag point team wrestlers, the, two two tag team point wrestlers that, and Eddie yeah. Guerrero. You know the the point in the Attitude Era where they were just flopping those belts around like they were fucking hotcakes, and I couldn't stand it. It was too much. It was way yeah. too much. <clears throat> no, I can understand that. I can understand that. There was a lot of uh, shock and swerve, but this was technically a lot of people consider this the end of the Attitude Era because real changing of the guard in the WWF, including with our next match, Tomas, which I know you're so excited to talk about. Oh, my goodness. And there's a great anal anal analogy I want to bring up with this match. It's a match we've talked about before in the future in retrospectives. Mm -hmm. It's Kurt Angle. It's Chris Benoit. You know what? At this point, if you know, you just know. Mm -hmm. We've talked about Angle and Benoit before. We've talked about their WWE Championship match, the Royal Rumble uh, 03. We've talked about, you know, just how good they clicked in 02 pay-per-views. We've talked about it. But here's the thing. That's not 
that's not a bad thing whatsoever. Watching Benoit and Angle wrestle is like eating a chocolate chip cookie fresh out of the oven. You yeah. know what it's going to taste like. You know it's going to be amazing. It doesn't change the fact that you're going to enjoy every single bit of it. And Absolutely. this match was everything I could have wanted in more in a pure... This was the pure wrestling match of the night. Absolutely. And this was just, oh, excellent from start to finish. For sure. But I'd be remiss if I were to leave out discussing Kurt Angle's hilarious promo before the match. And he's running down how Texas is missing 49 stars on its flag. And I'm like, what a dickhead. And then he's he finishes it off with, lose the freaking cowboy hats, people. And then Paul <laughs> Heyman, fucking Paul Heyman on commentary is like, yeah, he's talking to you. Lose the freaking cowboy hat, please. And I'm like, God, Angle was such a cheap heat magnet yeah. back in and, the day. And the amazing thing is he thought he was the hero talking about this. You know, that's what made him so good back in the Attitude Era. He was saying all these horrendous things, but he thought he was the good guy. You know, like. And Angle it. is justifiably angry coming into this match. Remember, 30 days prior, he was the WWF champion. Yeah. If you yeah. were the WWF champion and you thought you were going to Mania and you're just, you know, not to discredit this match, but just in the mid card now, I, I'd be frustrated kayfabe wise too. A little bit. So he had yeah. every single right to run down the state that he was in. He was pissed. Absolutely. And Benoit, I believe Benoit was working heel a lot, like on the road to WrestleMania, but then he runs into Kurt Angle and he's the one working babyface, which honestly I think worked wonders for Benoit around that time. I think, honestly, Tomas, if I could nitpick one little thing about this match before I really get into it, um, Benoit should have won this. I really think Benoit should have won this because I think, like, at this point in his career, like, Kurt Angle had already been the WWF champion. Benoit had been so close on the cusp. Like, he literally, I'm, I'm recalling Fully Loaded 2000, where he main evented against The Rock for the title. And a dusty finish prevented Benoit from walking out of Dallas, Texas that night with the WWF championship. So, again, a lot of trial and tribulation for Benoit, his first few years in WWF. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. going to change. We're getting there. We're getting Absolutely. there. We're getting there. Absolutely. Um, I think, yeah. Yeah, to... I can definitely see what, what you're coming from there. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, not to deter, de deter from this match a little. Don't Angle and Benoit have an ultimate submission match at Backlash? They sure do. They sure do. And honestly, I liked the ultimate submission match more than this. Um, this was honestly, of their big trilogy of matches that we've talked about, this one, then Unforgiven 02, then Royal Rumble 03. Um, I would honestly put this, I think it was a little better than Unforgiven 02, but not nearly as good as Rumble 03. Didn't have that drama. Oh, yeah, most definitely. But This match didn't th have the this title was on the line. It sure was. And like there yeah. were at least three crossface attempts in the early going. Benoit was out wrestling him. And then Angle just decks him in the face and it becomes a full on freaking like slug fest at that point. Angle's throwing Benoit into the stairs. Um, Benoit's hitting a dynamite kid style superplex off the top rope. Benoit is stealing Angle's finisher. Angle is doing the same thing with Benoit, which again, I love it. That's Your favorite, one of my favorite trope. tropes. Yep. Angle with the Crippler crossface. That just hits so different. But uh, um, I'd like to challenge everybody. If you go back and watch WrestleMania X7, um, if you want to do a drinking game, uh, take a shot for every suplex you see in this match. Oh. Yeah. You're welcome. So many suplexes. <laughs> so, so many, many beautiful suplexes. suplexes. Yep. None of them hit by Brock Lesnar. But uh, Kurt Angle, there's a point where he's in the Crippler crossface with referee Jack Doan down and unconscious. And Angle, once again, is tapping to the Crippler crossface, um, which honestly, thinking about it, it makes more sense that Angle won this match. Um, spoiler alert. Um, just because it still made Benoit look strong by making Angle tap to his finisher. Um, and again, Angle would hit an Angle slam for a two count. Benoit is reversing Angle's patented moonsault, hitting the diving headbutt, which is a big yikes looking at it in hindsight. You know, I would say never do that again, Chris Benoit, but, uh, I don't know. Yeah, we're, we're going back in time now, so. <laughs> little bit, little bit, but, uh, Kurt Angle, Kurt Angle had to use a roll up and tights to be Chris Benoit. He had to cheat to win this one. Um, so he barely squeaks out with a victory at WrestleMania. Um, Which usually 
I would complain. You know, I don't, I'm not a big fan of those finish, but considering what this led up to, storytelling wise, it made sense. You know, yeah. these two were perfectly evenly matched. Angles frustrated. He cheated to win. Okay, next month you can't cheat to win because right. you got to get more submissions submissions than the other opponent to win the match. These two are a great match for each other, man. They really were. Um, four stars. I'm giving it four and three quarters. I was a lot. Oh, damn. Yeah. You know, the only reason why it's not five is because it was a little bit too overbooked for my liking compared to some of their other installments. Unforgiven 2002. Well, considering how much I loved it and sat, I got to bump mine up a little uh, four and a quarter. All right. All right. Yeah. You know, that's fine. That's fine. You know, I was like, man, four stars. I went four and three quarter, but you know, that's all good. But um, compared to some of their other installments, especially compared to uh, Royal Rumble 2003 for the WWE Championship, um, this installment definitely felt a lot more like complicated and overbooked, and it didn't really feel as simple as some of their other installments, if that makes sense. But I mean, not to say I didn't enjoy it, because I really did, obviously. Four and three quarters is damn near perfect, but uh, stay tuned, my friends. It, the perfectness of this show does not end here. Um, next up, um, actually, so there is a backstage interview with Kurt Angle saying, like, I can't respect Chris Benoit. I beat him one, two, three in the ring. Benoit sneak attacks him, makes him tap to the cross face in the interview area. In the So that would set up the ultimate submission match for the next month. But uh, up next, a very personal matchup. And I know you want to talk about one of these competitors, at least. It's for the WWF Women's Championship. Ivory from right to center is defending against the ninth wonder of the world, China. And I know you wanted to gush about China for a minute. Yeah, because this is probably, unless we go back and do some more Attitude Era pay reviews, wink, wink. Uh, this is going to be one of the few times we get to talk about China. Because in our retrospective going on in 03, they don't talk about China a lot. And no. that's a damn shame because China is a pioneer, mm -hmm. not just for women, but for professional wrestling in general. Mm -hmm. China does not get the recognition I feel like she deserves. She, again, pioneer, a legend in her era. She was doing things that no woman would ever even be seen doing in the Attitude Era. She's winning intercontinental titles. She's wrestling yeah. against men. She's putting, she's just showing up the men, honestly. Still, still the only woman to ever hold the Intercontinental Championship, might I add. No exactly. And just it. considering everything China has done for the business, it's a damn shame that she is being not highlighted due to Triple H's bitter personal feelings towards her. People who don't know, China and Triple H used to date in the Attitude Era. It yep. did not end well. And because of that, Triple H will never, has never really shown the spotlight to her, even to this day, refusing to put her in the Hall of Fame due to better personal reasons. Unless, um, it's, uh, unless it's in a group with DX, you know? Exactly. And Shawn Michaels, keep in mind, Shawn Michaels was the one who acknowledged China, not Hunter. So Yeah. Um, we don't want to get too into details. Let's no. just say China had a career after professional wrestling and there was nothing yeah. wrong with that career yeah. but triple h is using that career as an excuse to say oh we can't put someone like that in the hall of fame don't get me started hunter in that regard go fuck yourself china deserves an entire wing of the hall of fame dedicated to her because there never has been someone like china and i'm saying this right now there will never be someone like china ever again no. yeah, unless someone point. wants to come out and prove me wrong yeah. And unless WWE wants to start intergender wrestling again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a point. China's where, a legend. There was a point where Vince Russo wanted to make China the WWF champion in 1999. If anybody I think remembers, she if anybody remembers China, held the China was supposed to challenge Stone Cold at SummerSlam 1999. I believe she won a number one contenders match, but then Triple H ended up taking her spot. But again, also, another topic I do not care what a single person says. China is on. Fight me on that. Yeah. Freaking China, love her. China got a huge pop from this crowd. And Ivory, who, again, horrible night for the right to center. Ivory looked so horrified. She was out there all by herself. The RTC was banned from ringside. And basically, China, the but match really there isn't is. Much. Yeah. It, they're the second stipulation to this match that makes me fucking laugh that Heyman pointed out. 
Hmm. So right to censor in China and Ivory had to sign a hold harmless agreement. So in Heyman's words, Ivory could break China's neck tonight and there's nothing anybody can do about it. (laughs) This match was built up as you wanted to see China get her hands around Ivory's puny neck. It reminds me of what they would do later with Alexa Bliss and Ronda Rousey. You don't have them touch each other. You wait until the perfect time, and then you see... Um, I'm sorry. Uh, Okay, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Sorry, I messed this up with my screen. And then you see what happens on the pay-per-view. No, it's all good, but... um... Yeah, then you you tune into the pay-per-view, and you see that scrawny little heel, you know, get what's coming to her. But then if you watch the hype package for this match, there really wasn't any hold harmless agreement. Like, they could touch each other. China was abusing Ivory in the build-up to this match. And they had, like, a brief little, like, I don't want to call it a squash match, but there was, like, a little segment they had at the Royal Rumble a couple months before this where China broke her neck off the handspring elbow um, that she does, like the cartwheel, like, elbow thing that she did into the corner, which was very athletic for someone of China's uh, stature. But <clears throat> yeah, basically match was not much, pretty much just a squash match. China was just throwing ivory all over the squared circle. And she basically just pins her with a press slam. I really can't rate this match. Um, it's honestly, it was too- satisfying considering definitely. if you watch all the buildup. Absolutely. And- the the, the, the the blow off to this was very satisfying because now China's the women's champion. Absolutely. Uh, for the first time remember. in her career. For the first time in her career at that point, which... Yeah, because she was off holding the men's titles and, mm-hmm. you know, making the men look good. Yeah. Making exactly. Jared look good. Making Jericho look good. Never forget, Jericho in China, the only co-intercontinental champion in existence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Royal Rumble 2000. That might be another topic for later on, but... Uh, Honestly, this was too short to really be much of value other than a WrestleMania moment for a pioneer like China. I think that's the best way to describe her for women's wrestling. She was a pioneer. There's no other way around that. And, oh, yeah. But I have a question for you. Imagine, like, how much more memorable this moment would have been if China beat Ivory in, like, 25 seconds. Oh, yeah. Like, if- I think they did drag it out a little more than it yeah. needed to be. It, it was a little bit long. I feel like, you know... it you're getting the point across China should just go out there, press slam ivory one time. Then that's it. You know? Yeah. It just, you know, it is very, it's very, uh, and it's very sad that this is still very high in the age of wrestling where the women, you know, this was their only match. The women's championship wasn't viewed as much, but thankfully China was popular. Everybody loved her. Oh, yeah. uh, with the exception of Triple H, she was my favorite entrance of the night because, you know, she was just genuinely <laughs> over with the crowd. Oh, yeah. No, and she comes out with that weird, like, pyro gun thing that she had. It was yeah, at least so, her pyro gun so worked, sick. unlike Shawn Michaels. <laughs> Maybe in 19. <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine? Oh, my God. But, uh, yeah. oh, man, here we are, Tomas, one of the big ones. Woo. I feel like everybody forgets about this match. Right. And... I'm going to be perfectly honest. I did too, but I'm glad I got to see this again. Shane McMahon versus Vince McMahon in a street fight. Yes, sir. Mick Foley is the special guest referee. Mick Foley is interviewed before this match, and he is asked, will you call it right down the middle? And Foley basically says, of course, I'm not going to let the fact that Vince fired me a month ago and kicked me off of my commissioner spot. I'm not going to let any of my personal feelings Keep me from calling this right down the middle. Don't right. know if Foley was being sincere or not, but more on that later. More, um, yep. That's, that'll come up for sure. But uh, yeah, Mick Foley is just so earnest in that interview too. He was so so, yeah. so good at what he does. Um, um, the but... build-up to this match is basically Vince and Shane are at each other's neck. It's father versus son. Mm-hmm. Uh, Vince is wa- Vince's wife, Linda, is in a comatose state. And for the past few months, Vince has been wheeling her around, wheeling around his vegetable wife, cheating on her right in front of her, yeah. making out with Trish Stratus every ch- every chance he got. And if there's one thing you do not do, you do not mess with Shane's mama. And yeah, I don't care if you're Vince McMahon, because Shane Whoa. 
is going to fight his own father <laughs> for the glory of his mother. This will be important for the one of the 2003 retros coming up in one of these next few months. But uh, You don't mess with Shane's mama. Yeah, this storyline was basically just for a few months. It was McMahon family drama, and there was a line in this promo. So Vince was pretty much going through the midlife crisis at this point, cheating on his wife with Trish Stratus as a prime example. And um, Shane basically comes into the game and he's like, I ain't going to stand no more. Um, and Vince was like, there was a line in this video package where he said, I will never, ever forgive your mother for giving birth to you. And I'm like, fucking relax, Vince. <laughs> fucking relax. It's just a promo, you know? <laughs> like, that is just so, it's like one of the most despicable things you will ever hear somebody say on WWF television around this point. Bar none bar none but then but then you have an added added element to this little as if the mcmahon family drama wasn't enough as if vince wanting a divorce from his wife wasn't enough wcw declares bankruptcy like a week before wrestlemania vince swoops in he signs the contract and he's like i now own wcw and the go home raw simulcast with the final episode of nitro and Nitro ends with Shane McMahon coming to the ring in Panama City, Florida. And he's like, I now own WCW. One of the most because famous raw moments in history. The contract reads McMahon, but it's not Vince. It's Shane. So yep. Shane owns his father's competition just to stick it to him. They oh, had yeah. to squeeze in that little WCW thing right before WrestleMania. They had to. And you know what? This match is the definition of all of the high drama, Jerry Springer, crazy redneck soap opera yes. that was known as the Attitude Era. And you know what? I loved every single moment of this match. This was It was so crazy fun. from start to finish. Absolutely. This was, by the way, fun facts for the viewers. This is unbelievably Vince McMahon's first WrestleMania as a competitor in the ring. He had been promoting WrestleMania for 16 years up to this point. Never competed in the ring. And, of course, his first match is against the product of his semen, his son, Shane. <laughs> you know? Oh, we will get to that when yeah. we get to that. <laughs> I, had to, I had to pull out that impression. I'm sorry. But, not uh, looking forward to that one. Pardon my French, but Shane McMahon's jersey is the typical Mania X7 colors on the jersey, like blue and gold. On the back, it says, Vince, we have a problem. Which, of course, oh, is love it. Which of I course, miss Shane's custom derbies. Yes, which of course alludes to uh, Apollo 13's Houston, we have a problem. So um, that was on the promotional poster for WrestleMania X7, that quote and everything. So Shane was, you know, Shane was doing it right there. But Vince how was weird was it to see Shane come out not to his iconic Here Comes the Money? Oh my God. So <laughs> it's even weirder that both competitors come out to the same exact theme song yeah <laughs> i'm like does it matter who wins this match we're just gonna hear the same music at the end you know but um vince mcmahon has the heat early also known as child abuse um pretty much <laughs> take that as also will. let's not leave out the fact that stephanie was accompanying vince oh, to the ring God. in this match and she is just the biggest little princess brat i have ever seen in my life she, she is, is wearing a bedazzled jumpsuit that says daddy's girl on the back of it she is condoning her father's actions so she is obnoxious. condoning him cheating on her mother right in which, front of him she which is, is condoning so weird. which is the so abuse weird. of her own brother because might i add stephanie was fighting trish at the pay-per-view the month before exactly what it's, the hell <laughs> like, oh more on trish later she yeah, will become we'll a factor there. in this match <laughs> We'll get there. Shane McMahon, there was a point. So I got to praise Mick Foley also at this moment because Shane McMahon is whipping his father with a Singapore cane. And Mick Foley looks over to Paul Heyman at the commentary table and he's like, this is all legal. Don't worry. It's a street fight. It's all legal. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> Mick Foley's the fucking best, dude. Like, I don't care what anybody says. Mick Foley's the man. But there is a uh, monitor to the face of his dad. Then we get one of the most iconic shots of the night. Shane goes up to the elbow drop. Uh, Michael Cole is not losing his voice on commentary 15 years later when Shane does the same thing to The Undertaker. 
but he leaps off the top rope. Stephanie pulls her dad out of the way. Shane goes careening through the Spanish announce table. It's such a beautiful visual, which would be one of the key, key little clips that you would see in those "Don't Try This at Home" vignettes that you got oh, yeah. those VHS tapes. Back and in the this day. is where the match gets crazy. It's so first, fucking crazy. First, Trish comes out. And she starts jaw jacking with Stephanie. Stephanie is jaw jacking with Foley. Trish Stratus just says, fuck it. Well, she Trish brings Linda with her to the yes. ring. They it's just important. decide, fuck it, cat fight. Stratus and Stephanie, they're brawling all over the place. Foley's trying to well, break it up. Well, Stephanie it was because, slaps the shit out of Foley. Well, it was because Trish slapped Vince McMahon in a huge swerve at that point. Yes, Trish because... slaps Vince. Stephanie gets pissed. They start brawling. Foley's trying to break it up. Stephanie slaps Foley, and that's when Foley says, fuck it, Trish Stratus. You can have her. Go fight her. <laughs> you know, they go brawling to the back. Vince McMahon, that evil bastard, turns to Linda. She is yeah. unguarded. She is, I'm starting to get scared now. Vince makes his way toward Linda. Foley, the angel sent from above that he is, Comes in, steps in front of Vince, and says, absolutely not. You are not going to lay a finger on her. Nope. Foley turns, goes to wheel Linda out of the arena, and that bastard Vince blasts Foley in the back of the head with a chair. And then and blasts him hits, in the fucking head with a chair. Which is Good probably Lord. the safest chair shot that Foley has ever taken in his career. Yeah, yeah. Maybe more on that later if we do some more Attitude Era stuff with Mick Foley on it. But uh there are um, there are asshole chants at this point. I was wondering who they were chanting asshole at, Vince or Linda. Um, but, this is uh, back in 2001. Of um, course. Foley's out of the equation now. He, this bastard, throws his wife into the ring, sets her up in the corner, and basically tells her, "You're." Go by the way, while this is all happening, Shane's still down. Shane yeah. is still down from oh, the table spot. Shane's been out unconscious this whole time after going through the Spanish announce table. So Okay, just... this match is 14 minutes long. I think for seven of those minutes, Shane was down. <laughs> he was down for a very long time. Well, I mean, that way he doesn't turn beat red throwing those fake punches at Vince. So, <laughs> like, um... But Vince has Linda set up. He grabs a trash can. He goes to hit Shane with it. But Linda stands up. Oh my oh God, the, my God. <laughs> the plot thickens. Linda stands up. Shane immediately in his groggy state points like, turn around, dad. <laughs> it's Linda. He <laughs> looks like he just saw a ghost. And then Linda with her patented, yes, patented, because she uses it more than once in her career, yeah. kicks Vince McMahon in the balls. Fully right is back up. Peak. Fully is pissed. He starts beating the shit out of Vince. He's giving him the Foley forearms. He hits the cactus knee. He signals Shane to go up coast to coast. Shane wins. This such match a, is a roller coaster. Such a brilliant move, the coast to coast. A roller coaster of emotions for sure. Uh, none of which are coming out of Linda McMahon at that time period after the low blow. But uh, in any case, uh, <laughs> this is honestly, technically, this is like three and a quarter, maybe three and a half of them being really nice. But this is wrestling at its soap opera finest. Uh, there were so oh, yeah. many twists, so many twists and turns. But uh, I'm going to give it three and a half because this is like the spectacle match of the night, not counting TLC two. Uh, this was like then the probably other than the main event, this is probably the most story driven match of the night. And like yeah. I said, like you said, every WrestleMania needs that soap opera match. And this was it. And I think it <laughs> delivered very well. What doesn't deliver very well is what they do after this pay-per-view. So we have Vince being the evil bastard he is. And again, you don't mess with Shane's mama and no. Shane fighting for the honor no. of his mom. He hugs his mom after the match. It's a very beautiful moment. But what happens after that? Shane and Stephanie turn heel. Oh, the fucking invasion angle. That's that's another story for another time. Let me repeat that. Shane, who was fighting for the honor of his mother, who was in a comatose state, while Vince is cheating on her right in front of him, right in front of her, <laughs> The cheating Vince turns into a baby face. The cheating Shane, bastard is the face. And then Shane and Stephanie turn heel because WWF good, WCW bad. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. 
exactly you know that oh makes, my god makes perfect sense but uh you know like okay so if angle and benoit was the technical wrestling masterpiece of the night this is your soap opera masterpiece of the night and then you get to your next match which for people who are into spot fests this is the match for you we're talking about tlc2 for the wwf tag team titles the dudleys the hardys Edge and Christian, let's fucking go. This is one of my favorite tag team title matches ever. I'm this not This is another one of those, if you know, you know. If yeah. you know, you just fucking know. Yep. Three of the best tag teams in the WWF right now. Did you forget that Rhino was aligned with Edge and Christian? Because I sure fucking did. I did, yep. And this was right after ECW's bankruptcy. So WWF picked up Rhino's contract and they just stuck it with Edge and Christian for God knows what reason. Um... But these guys are just all over the ring. I didn't take a whole lot of notes on this match, honestly, just because I wanted to sit there and enjoy it. Um, I did. Exactly. I, I would say you take it away. This match <laughs> is a, a demolition derby from start it to finish. It really is. Yeah. WWE likes to use the term human demolition derby. This is exactly what this match was. There were just spots galore. The Dudley boys hit the was up on edge early on before getting the tables. Uh, cause that's kind of what they had to do. It's kind of routine. They hit the was up, which Jr. did say will, uh, adversely affect your sexual drive. Um, yeah. Yeah. He's not I wrong. Agree. He's definitely not wrong. It's a headbutt to the, uh, to the also, regions. did you ever notice just like with gold dust, the referee is always conveniently distracted for whenever the Dudleys hit that move. Yeah. It's kind of like they set up for the move and I know it doesn't count in this match, but any other regular tag team match it's kind of like the referee looks at it and goes oh wait i should turn my head oh what's over here a turnbuckle oh that's yeah. nice yeah i'm not going to see the blatant low blow that's going on behind there me there were there were a lot of dick shots in this match i don't know what it was but matt hardy matt hardy just to give you an example was in the tree of woe edge and christian get up on the second rope and one like a foot a piece is stomping down on matt's pain and like jesus christ like how like, how does that not hurt him? You know, disturbing, disturbing, especially if you're a man. But this match, definitely a big spot fest. And six guys, if you thought six guys was, wasn't was enough, boy, oh boy, we get Spike Dudley interference. Um, and he hits the Dudley dog on Christian Cage through a table on the outside. And JR is selling it like freaking, like Spike Dudley killed the poor guy going through the table. It was so good. Again, right. if this is a demolition derby, then Spike Dudley is the human crash test dummy. Pretty much. And then fucking Rhino comes in, and he's the human rhinoceros. You know, he comes in, gores Matt Hardy as hard as he possibly can through a table that's set up in the corner, and Matt is selling it like he was just in a car wreck himself. Like, beautiful. Absolutely picture perfect. But that's not enough, because then we get Lita interference, because... Team Extreme, Rhino Gord Lita the week before on SmackDown, and Lita is listen everybody. Back. If you say Lita was not your first goth crush, then you are wrong. Yeah, you are one hundred percent wrong. That's right. Lita is a badass, and she was That's everyone's right. first goth crush um, growing up watching the WWF. <laughs> yeah, so Lita comes out. Edge is climbing the ladder. Lita jerks Edge off the ladder. I mean, she pulls Edge off the ladder. Oh, um, <laughs> yeah. J. Did anybody notice that Jr. said like Lita jerking Edge off? And I'm like, yes. I mean. Read between the lines, my friends. Read between yes. the lines. But uh, Lita, Lita hits Spike Dudley in the head with a steel chair as hard as she fucking can. And then she gets 3D'd for her troubles by the Dudleys. Like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Jesus Christ, what a sequence. But uh, there is a... Uh, so Rhino is on Bubba's shoulders. Devon comes off the top rope. And Paul Heyman calls it the Dudleyville device. Not the Doomsday device. Even though it's the same exact fucking move. But... Um, Paul, yes. Heyman, Paul Heyman, very, very careful. Um, and he was gushing about the Dudley's background, even during their entrance, which again, former ECW guys. So Paul Heyman is sure to gush about them, but, um, I will say, I think this is probably the best use of WCW and ECW talent that WWF did as well Yeah, and on this show and Just around like this time. Yeah. Yeah. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Because this is a show that doesn't even have Rob Van Dam on it, and he would come into the picture later on, and you know how his career would have turned out. But um, there's there's just so many different spots to go over. Jeff Hardy jumping off that high ladder through Rhino and Spike Dudley through the tables. Jeff Hardy trying to tightrope walk on a bunch of ladders in the ring to get to the titles, and it almost ends in catastrophe, falling off the top of the ladder. Jeff saves himself. And then he's hanging off the top. Bubba Ray Dudley pulls the ladder off from underneath him. Edge spears Jeff Hardy off the damn ladder down to the canvas. My God. My God. One of the most iconic images of the night is that spear from Edge. Loved it. Absolutely loved it. But. Oh, yeah. That's definitely an image that is burned into my retina for the rest of my life. Yes. Again, when you think of TLC, when you think of those three tag teams, you can't not think about that spot because i think it was in a documentary i forget i think it was with edge and i think it was part of edge's documentary and he was asked about that and he basically said no we did not fucking rehearse that that is not something you can rehearse we just did it yes it fucking hurt (laughs) yeah (laughs) you think you think anybody who says wrestling is fake now yeah go watch this match so um Speaking to quote of, JR, how do you learn how to fall off a 20-foot ladder? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think he's even able to stand. He doesn't have a damn clue where yeah. he is. You know, <laughs> don't try this at home videos, but I had surgery um, five times in my left knee. No, Ray Mysterio was not on this card. We're not doing that. We're not doing that. Let's go. <laughs> so f- fucking relax. But um Bubba Ray Dudley and Matt Hardy are at the top of the ladder, and Rhino comes in. Pushes the ladder over. There's a huge stack of four tables, pyramided one on top of the other. Bubba and Matt crash and burn, very similar to how they did it at SummerSlam the year before. Like, so, so nasty, my friends. So, so nasty. But then eventually, Devon is climbing one side of the ladder. Christian's up on the other side, needing the assist from Rhino. Christian grabs the belt, mercilessly ends this thing. Um, five stars. Five stars easy. One of the original spot fests. What a spectacular matchups. Spectacular. Start to finish. Oh, yeah. Five stars. Again, if you know, you know, human demolition derby. This match is one of the most iconic matches of all time. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely one of my favorite tag team title matches of all time in WWE history. That's for sure. This thing was never going to stop, especially considering Edge was in the ring. And he would have that Rob Zombie song catered to him, like, you know, six months after this. It was never going to stop. So, um. no. <laughs> um, but. Okay. Oh, boy. With that being said. Oh, Zach, boy. What the, what the fuck do we have next? What the, what the fuck is this? <laughs> I'll tell you what, what it is. What, what the, do we have next? <laughs> it's, it's the gimmick battle royal. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know, it's a parade I'm going to say this right now. I'm going to bury the lead. This match goes less than four minutes it does so i want to talk about every single person who was in this match oh are you looking it up <laughs> is that yes i am that's up. why okay. my camera is up right now listen them um, up. here we go okay here we go um i i need, I need the list like i'm on the wikipedia page and it doesn't <laughs> you just have made the list the entire list <laughs> I, I i need this i like, can i can i can find the oh list okay for you. Are you ready for this? No. The entrances went on for days because they, sure did. they got every single fucking gimmick they could oh my to God. be in this fucking match. Also, let's put it out there. Uh, uh, Bobby Heenan and uh, Jay yeah. Okerlund were the commentators for this match. May they rest I will in admit, peace. I marked out for that. May they rest <laughs> I marked in out peace. for Heenan. The crowd Heenan and Okerlund. The crowd pops huge for Bobby Heenan, especially, and the announcers were popping huge for Bobby yes. Heenan. Yes, JR said, one of my personal favorites, and yeah. how could you... All right, how could we you have not? the Bushwhackers, Luke and Butch. We have Draws. <laughs> we have Doink the Clown, Nikolai Volkov, Tugboat, the Goon. The Goon, Earthquake. the hockey guy. The We also have Duke the Dumpster Drozzy, the garbage man. We uh, have the Gobbly Cooker. We have Brother Love, a.k.a. Bruce Pritchard, a.k.a. Get the fuck out of producing WWE shows. Yeah, the f- fuck you, Brother Love. <laughs> yeah, the fabulous Freebird himself, Michael P.S. Hayes. With his, conservative, with his conservative flag 
like bedazzled in a cape form and i'm like i don't oh, want this fucking guy to win you know one man game kamala with his manager harvey whippleman Kim Chi, who is Kamala's trainer. Why is he in this match? I have no fucking clue who James Kim Chi was. James E. Cornette. Yeah, yeah. Tennis racket and all. Mm-hmm. Repo Man. Also Sergeant known, Slaughter. Yeah, Repo Man, also known as Demolition Smash or Barry Darsal for old school fans. Yeah, and, and I mean this so unironically, my personal favorite in the match, Hillbilly Jim. Hillbilly I'm not Jim. Kidding. I you love know, him. He seems I like, love Hillbilly. He seems like such a down to earth nice guy in real life. Um, but this goes out to the editors of the WWE network on Peacock. Where the fuck was my country boy theme song? Where was it? Exactly. Where the fuck what was the it? Fuck? I wanted to dance, but uh um this match if was you don't know, go watch and watch Legend House. You will see Hillbilly Jim is the nicest fucking person in the world. Yeah. And I don't know if Hillbilly's not in the Hall of Fame or not, but WWE needs to get is. on that shit. He is. He is. He good. Is. Yeah. Good, good, good. Uh, he is in the Hall of Fame, and he, like, there's a bit with Mick Foley talking about, like, uh, he's talking about the, uh, like, the Hall of Fame speech that Terry Funk gave him, and he was like, it was brief. And then the interviewer, like, was, like, he facepalmed. He was like, Hillbilly Jim. And then Mick Foley was like, if you listen closely, you can still hear Hillbilly Jim talking. <laughs> You know, <laughs> bless his heart. You know his. But yeah, no, I love Hillbilly Jim. Yeah. What the fuck happened right. with this match? It started and then half the participants were out. Yeah, yeah, because it was just a parade of old dudes. Nikolai Volkov is tossed over the top rope like nobody's business. Kamala was dominating. By the way, he chucked out like half of this field to the point where I thought he was including his own win. trainer, Kim Chi. Yeah. Yeah, every man for himself, you know? You gotta you gotta get the bragging rights from the gimmick battle royal, you know what I mean? Like, nothing on the line. But Sergeant Slaughter, the heavy favorite to win this match, was chucked out by Hillbilly Jim, who then was chucked out by the eventual winner, the Iron Sheik. Because, get this, the Iron Sheik only won this match because his legs would not allow him to go over the top rope to the floor. That's why the Iron Sheik won. <laughs> so... so- let me ask you something. Was WWE even aware of that, or did they just grab every single motherfucker that would say yes? Oh, yeah. Because if that's the case, then Sheik should have been in the match. Probably, yeah. Iron Sheik took forever to get to the ring, and Bobby Heaton was like, by the time the Iron Sheik gets to the ring, it'll be WrestleMania 38. Which, We're almost there. By my calculation, yeah, if you look closely, you could still see Iron Sheik walk into the ring. <laughs> is, is, is that next year? It is. It is next April. So it's going to, we're going to see Sheik finally make it to the ring. By that time, we should see Iron Sheik make it to the ring just to play off that joke that Bobby Heaton made. But, uh, oh, good Lord. Iron Sheik wins this. I can't really rate this match, honestly, but I can't just, either. I don't want to shit on it, though, because no. it just made me laugh. <laughs> it's no, it's no heroes of wrestling bullshit that Iron Sheik and Nikolai Volkov had to go through the previous year. Um, no, but which, it's just, is this, why would WWF even consider doing this? It's one of the great mysteries of the Orient. Well, also, uh, also take under consideration that they were taking a hiatus from putting people in the Hall of Fame around this time. This would probably be the point in the show if it were a modern day WrestleMania where they would like bring out the Hall of Fame inductees and then they would like, hey, you know, give them a standing ovation. But instead, you're going to put them in a battle royal, you know? So, because why? I the mean, not? it's <laughs> it's just one of those things you just remember. Um, yeah. yeah. What a what a what the a trip. gimmick battle royal, you know? Yeah. Just... What, what a trip. Uh, I give it six stars. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Fucking relax. It wasn't that good. It wasn't that good. But um, speaking of, you know, a few uh, good uh, matches. What's that fucker's name? I don't like. Melter, fuck oh, you, Melter. Fuck Gimmick you. Battle Royal. Relax, relax. <laughs> but, Gimmick uh... Battle Royal six stars. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, that was believe it or not, that six star clinic was the palate cleanser between the TLC two match and what's up next, the Undertaker versus Hunter Hearst Helmsley man in a first time ever showdown one on one. Believe it or not, um, this was pretty much a. This is what I loved about this match. It was such a simple build up to it. These two had never wrestled before. Triple H has said that he's beaten everybody. And then out comes the Undertaker, who's like, 
You're standing in my yard, son. I'm the big dog. Okay, who so runs get that this. Yard. Undertaker is your baby face. Yeah. So he he was not allowed to touch Triple H or Stephanie or anyone in the McMahon family. So he ordered his brother Kane to yeah. lift Stephanie over his head and threaten to throw her off a ledge. Exactly. If Regal did not give Taker a match with Triple H. Right. Yeah. Your baby face, ladies and gentlemen. Exactly. Yeah. No, I don't see what the issue is. I really no, don't no, see No issue whatsoever. Undertaker was, you know, beating the system. He was basically sending his brother to do his uh, dirty work for him that he wanted to do. But also, it, it, real quick before we get to the serious part, I love how this match was advertised that Stephanie was going to be in Triple H's corner, but she right. is nowhere to be found at this point. Nowhere to be found. And, uh, yeah, good thing because Triple H comes out to the ring by himself to your favorite entrance of the night. Uh, the one and only Motorhead plays Triple H down to the ring. Rest in peace, Lemmy. You are such a oh, badass. Like, such a I love this entrance. entrance. It was the first time Lemmy ever performed Triple H out to the ring, and I know he'd do it again at WrestleMania 21, but yep. this one just hit harder, in my it opinion. It sure did. And, like, just the visual of Triple H walking out in that stadium, doing his pose, like, with all the flash bulbs going off as the theme is playing live. Nothing, nothing hits like that. And then The Undertaker comes out and says, I can do you one better in terms of cinematography. There's a shot of Taker just speeding down the ramp. And, like, good Lord. Like, just the visual of that. It's so incredible. Absolutely Considering awesome. he had a longer ramp to work with at 19, and he didn't drive nearly as fast as that one. <laughs> yeah, probably, uh, probably The Undertaker's quickest WrestleMania entrance he's ever done. Um, considering probably his entrances at 20 and 21 probably took twice as long as this one. But um, in any regard, um, they start fighting on the outside. It's a brawl from the very beginning. They're throwing soup bones coal at each other. Um, and Triple H immediately like falls over this replaced Spanish announce table, which is just this rinky-dink thing at this time. He just falls on that, and the table just falls down. Another Spanish announced table added to the graveyard for WrestleMania 17. Ah, uh, my only issue with this match, and it's a nitpick, I can't believe this was just a regular old match. Right. Because they really had to stretch the rules on this one. They did. They did. That that referee, Mike Kyoto, was taking a nap for so long for these guys to go out and do this brawl so they weren't counted out. And that's eventually what they do. They uh They start, you know... They start, it's pretty much your typical big Haas fight. Triple H pulls out the sledgehammer, and then, you know, he slingshot into the official. Um, Taker hits a choke slam. He gets a two count. And then Taker elbow drops Mike Kyoto. So, and that is the most lethal elbow drop of all time because Kyoto is fucking dead for, again, this is an 18-minute match. I feel like for 10 of those minutes, Kyoto is taking oh, no. the peripheral dirt nap right now. I, no, no less than 12 minutes he was in that coma there. But, uh, yeah, he was – or in, in Taker's terms in 2010, Mike Kyoto was in a vegetative state. So yes. what happened <laughs> – you know, who, who remembers that gimmick from 2010 when Undertaker was put into a coma by his brother Kane, a 33-year plan? Oh, my goodness. Fruition, you know? <laughs> But anyway, yeah, I can't so, wait to talk about that in uh, 2029. <laughs> <laughs> Anywho, so there's a fun brawl that ensues. Um, and they fight towards where the hard cam is actually in the stadium, which was actually pretty new for that time. They never really fought towards the hard camera, to my recollection, during the Attitude Era. But they end up on the scaffold. Undertaker literally choke slams him all the way to hell off the scaffold otherwise known as a crash pad, which they can't show. Uh, but Triple H is down. <laughs> I like how they made it look like he fell from like 10 feet, but then they panned the camera down to him, and he's like two feet below Taker. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. No, he choke slammed him, you know, all the way to hell, which was like two feet below him. And then Taker jumps yeah. off the freaking scaffold doing a fucking elbow drop, and the crowd is way into this thing. Um, they go back to the ring. Taker hits a tombstone, but of course there is no official because Mike Kyoto is still in a fucking coma. Um, that almost rhymed. I don't know how. But uh, <clears throat> Taker is going for my favorite move of all time to hear called the last, last ride. ride. The last 
tried. Um, but unfortunately for me, that is countered because Triple H hits him with the damn sledgehammer. Such a revolutionary spot, but I've seen it done so many times. Like after that, it's, you know, for the first time ever, it was a cool spot. And the streak almost ended right there. Like, but I imagine? feel like that's a good point I want to get into. I think the streak was not being taken into consideration during this match. No, it wouldn't be after probably oh two where they started acknowledging it and saying like, you know what, we can't have Taker lose at this point. Yep, the iconic yeah. ten at WrestleMania ten eighteen. And He's ten and oh. <laughs> like, but... Yeah, but at this point, I'm pretty sure they just wanted Taker to go over. Oh yeah, oh yeah, for sure. Even though Taker gigged off that sledgehammer shot, off of that scar that uh, 16 Staples went into, and he did allude to it. Great psychology in this match. Um, Triple H then does a babyface move, bringing Taker over to the corner, does the corner punches. But then out of nowhere, Undertaker makes me the happiest man alive when he hits the last ride. The last ride i gotta i gotta repeat that you know because that's what just bring it does but uh yes hits it with a three count nine and oh at wrestlemania the crowd pops um see how well a hometown boy winning works vince mcmahon do you see how well it works because mm -hmm. i didn't even mention tanker was built from houston texas at this point in his career as the american badass where was this pay-per-view the astrodome in houston. houston so yeah a hometown man winning actually does work so Believe it or not. But what a fight this was. I mean, I did not rate this as high as you did. You told me your rating for this. I was shocked. I gave Four it and a half stars. This was such wow. a fun match. And I don't remember having as much fun as with this match as I did. This Definitely. is such an iconic match. And it's such a... It's a defining match for both Triple H and Undertaker, in my opinion. Definitely was very physical. Um, I gave this three and three quarters, though, because it was just so hard to not believe that the ref was not napping there. Exactly. The if I'm going to nitpick, it's going to be that this was just a regular match, and they really had to stretch the rules on this one. They really did. They really did. I personally liked their matches at 27 and 28 both better than this one. Um, it's. I think it's all going to come down to a personal preference, though. Oh, yeah. Um, it just gets better from here, believe it or not. Absolutely. Absolutely does. But speaking of just getting better, how are the, how in the fuck are we already at this main event? Oh, here we go. It's Time a simple by. main event, but it's an iconic main event. Mm -hmm. Stone Cold Steve Austin versus The Rock for the WWF Championship. Austin had won his third Royal Rumble at this Number point. Three. Yep. The only man to ever do that in history. Rock, it was basically... Rock won the Rumble. No, I'm sorry. Austin won the Rumble. Rock won the title at No Way Out. Let's get it on. They had yeah. main event at WrestleMania the year prior. Uh, there was a lot of speculation going into this pay-per-view. So simple. A lot, yeah, a lot of speculation going into this Mania main event because Vince had brought out Austin's wife, Deborah and basically told her, you're going to manage The Rock. And The Rock said, The Rock was a heel at this point. And Rock was saying, I did not ask for this at all. I don't know what the hell Vince is talking about. And, you know, it was just to stir the pot between Rock and Austin. And, you know, mm -hmm. the video package speaks for itself. You know, this all is... Vince had to do was just entertain that idea. Get the Rock and Austin going at each other. And they went at each other. Especially once My Way starts swelling into the video package, it becomes the greatest hype package of all time. It might be a hot take, but it's just such a simple match, such a simple build. And then we cut to the arena, and then Howard Finkel announces this match is now no disqualifications, which JR flips his lid over. And I'm like, why? Now we know there has to be a winner. Like Exactly. In my opinion, all WrestleMania main events should be no disqualification. I'm not saying every single WrestleMania main event needs weapons and low blows and interference. I'm just saying... Take the disqualifications and count outs out of the equation. You can have a five-star wrestling match and not have to worry about, you know, count outs and rope yeah. breaks. I mean, maybe rope breaks add to the drama of it, but you know what I mean. You know, totally. you don't need to incorporate the usual tropes of a no disqualification match. Again, don't say no disqualification. Say you can only win by 10 floor submission. I feel like Absolutely. all mania main events need that. Yeah, so... The Rock, a lot of people know, is my personal favorite wrestler of all time. He's the one who got me into the entertainment industry. Stone Cold Steve Austin is one of the greatest anti-heroes I've ever seen. This matchup right here, I know we were just talking about Undertaker and Hunter, like, briefly, their match at Mania 28 being the end of an era. 
This match right here was the end of an era. This was the funeral for the Attitude Era, so to speak. This was the greatest hits, the greatest misses of the Attitude Era all rolled up into one. And holy shit, what a grand finale and what an end game this was, theoretically, for what many consider the greatest era in wrestling history. Um, they didn't have WCW competition anymore, and they could just go balls to the wall, and they could just try whatever they wanted out. This was fucking amazing. Um, one of my personal favorite matches of all time, if not my favorite match of all time, honestly, like really, I have to really think about it, but, uh, this is certainly up there. Um, if you guys want a hot take, you guys are about to get really pissed off at me. Stone Cold Steve Austin's Disturbed theme is his best theme song. Fight me on that one. Fight me on it. It's good. It definitely it's, fit it's him during favorite. this time. The lyrics They were there... definitely, ex Yeah. They were experimenting with Austin and Rock around this time. And considering what happens at the end of this match, it would just, again, it would prove your point. It would really prove your point when it came to Austin at this point. Yeah. The crowd... uh, a lot of brawling in this match, a lot of high drama in this match. You know, they bled pretty early into this match. Yeah. Austin hit the Rock with the ring bell. The Rock gigged quite a bit for Stone Cold. Uh, who the crowd was heavily behind, by the way, because remember, it's in Texas. It's a partisan Texas crowd for the Rattlesnake. But uh, Austin hits a superplex on The Rock, who I would honestly say is one of the greatest stellars of all time, because even a simple superplex, The Rock looked like he was in pure agony. You know, it looked so painful. And, and you know, you get desperate in a match when Austin breaks out a move that he hadn't used in almost 10 years the when he was the dream. ringmaster, the million yeah. dollar dream. And Heyman even alludes to it back when Austin was the ringmaster under the million dollar man's learning tree. That is That was such a cool callback that Austin used that move. Absolutely. JR was marking out for that move because consider the fact that JR and Austin were like best buddies, like, you know, in real life. JR was in the hospital room when Austin came out of surgery and he was there for him in rehab. So... You know, this is this will come into play for later. But Stone Cold Steve Austin is beating the absolute shiznit out of the rock here. It was so vicious, absolutely physical. Uh, maybe their most physical of their WrestleMania trilogy. I would say that this is their best match of their three. Easily, easily, easily. Um, but then there's another exposed turnbuckle, which brings you back to the opener of this pay-per-view. The referee did not disqualify William Regal using the exposed turnbuckle. Obviously, you can't disqualify anybody in a no disqualification match. But uh, Austin gigs on the exposed turnbuckle. Then the Rock, you want to talk about a receipt, hits Austin as hard as he fucking can with the ring bell. Um, and then he locks in what I consider a pretty damn good sharpshooter. But does this remind anybody of WrestleMania 13? Absolutely, it does. Anybody, that iconic shot of Austin. Again, this is the end of an era, so you got to pull out all the stops. Austin pretty much replicates, you know, that iconic shot of him. Yeah, and if we're turn. gonna dip into the yeah, we're gonna dip into the foreshadowing. Remember, that was the iconic match where Austin went in his heel, and Brett was a babyface, and Brett got so frustrated with this match, and Austin just had the willpower that they had to switch them. Brett turned heel, and Austin turned face that night. Yep. But, you know, as that's just so poetic thinking about it more and more because that's a lot of people consider that the match where the Attitude Era started was with Mania 13 and uh, Austin's face turn that night. But, God, God I just can't. I, man, this match was amazing. Absolutely amazing. Oh, yeah. Going back and rewatching it. Um, and also, it has your favorite trope in there Rock hitting a Stone Cold <laughs> Stunner, baby. And then uh, freaking, there's a very close two count. JR is like, don't tell me The Rock is going to beat Austin with a Stone Cold Stunner. No! <laughs> like, and JR then is his fucking best. The plot oh, thickens. Vince yeah. McMahon makes his way out to the ring after mm -hmm. he was just absolutely obliterated by his own son, Shane. He, he sure comes did. out to observe it. JR makes a good point. Vince doesn't like either of these guys. He doesn't. Vince no longer has ties to The Rock. Vince and Austin are sworn enemies. Heyman does kind of start pulling the curtain back a little, but then he stops it just by immediately saying, hey, Vince is just out here to, you know, observe. This is, you know, this, this is, is his, his main, main event. event. He wants to make sure who he wants to win, you know, basically wins. Yeah. 
and he wants to make sure it goes off without a hitch. So The Rock basically hits the worst finisher in wrestling history, the People's Elbow. Even though I love the man, like, the People's Elbow is stupid. But he covers Austin. Vince pulls The Rock off the cover. And Paul Heyman is like, what the hell did he do that for? And The Rock pretty much, he puts two and two together. He starts chasing Vince around ringside. Stone Cold hits The Rock bottom! I love it. I love it more. I want more stolen finishers. Like, give me more of that. That's why I loved Edge and Seth Rollins so much at Crown Jewel. So many stolen finishers. Even though Edge never hit the unprettier. You know, another rant for another time. But basically, this is the story they're telling. Stone Cold Steve Austin is so desperate to be the WWF champion that he would sell his soul to the devil himself. And JR was going on and on about it. I thought I knew this man. And Stone Cold pulls out a steel chair that Vince McMahon gifted him. And, you know, he's hitting the stunner. He's hitting the rock bottom. He can't, like, do – there's nothing yeah, else he can that's do. that's when the desperation starts to show because he's starting to accept, accept Vince's help for this match. And then, you know, as this keeps continuing, a light bulb goes off in everyone's head. Austin yep. is starting to turn heel. Absolutely. And I am not exaggerating. When, you know, the realization is there, and I am not exaggerating when I say Austin beat The Rock to death with this steel chair. He fucking murdered this poor guy. Like, good Lord, he must have hit him with at least, like, 15, 17 chair shots, something like that, and then... Absolutely brutalizing The Rock. Mm -hmm. Just... Oh my God. I've never seen a, a harder beat down with a chair before chair in my life. Chair shot after chair shot. And that's what gets the rock down for the three count. A lot rock of was being shots. stubborn. He kicked out a few times, but after that beat down, it's kind of like rock just lay there. Just like, just, just end this. Just yeah. it's like, stay down. I'm just stay down or it's going to get worse. You know, but brilliant storytelling, brilliant drama and a brilliant swerve of Stone Cold Steve Austin shaking hands with the devil. As the new WWE JR champion. JR is livid. <clears throat> JR is fucking livid. The top heel in the business, Stone Cold Steve Austin. This is, in my mind, a five star clinic. This is my personal favorite WrestleMania main event of all time. Um, this is this heel turn right here. It's the second most shocking WrestleMania moment, only behind the ending of the streak. Because you never would have thought that Stone Cold would turn heel at this no. point in his career. And, and Austin, align himself with Vince? I believe Austin asked to turn heel at that point. Because Yeah, like this was WWF's equivalent of Captain America saying Hail Hydra. Yep, that's exactly what it was. Even though Stone yeah. Cold Steve Austin is nothing like Captain America. You know, those are two polar opposites if I ever saw one in terms of a hero. But Austin basically becomes the villain... But my thing is, the timing of this heel turn was just so, so poor. Um, just considering everything that happens after this heel turn, um, The Rock basically would go off to film The Scorpion King. Great fucking movie. Anybody ever saw The Scorpion King? Yeah. Uh, so basically, so worth it. the invasion happens. And Austin was doing pretty well in his heel run. The two-man power trip happens right after this pay-per-view. Yep. Austin has a nice thing going with him, but the minute the invasion happens, well, and you also, have your top star in the company, and WWE was like kind of out of between a rock and a hard place. Like take take into consideration that his tag team partner in the two man power trip tore his quad, you know, so they had to improvise a lot. You know, Triple H again, which was shocking. The night after Mania, Triple H would team up with Stone Cold after they would brutalize each other. Triple H would conspire to run Austin down at SummerSlam 99, and now they're teaming together. Like, it started off know. good, but you know what? For the moment alone, it was worth it. This mania, it, it right. was worth it. Austin, Austin had nobody left after this to fight. After The Rock went off to Hollywood for a little bit, he fought The Undertaker for a little bit, but there was nobody left. There was no Yeah, top they had face. to resort to turning Kurt Angle babyface. Yeah. Yeah, they and even had to, then, that didn't last long. There was a triple threat match at King of the Ring, Austin, Jericho, and Benoit, which was brilliant, but like... Jericho and Benoit were the biggest baby faces in the company at that point. Yep, yep. Which, so, nothing against Jericho and Benoit, the right. star power was starting to wear thin. That's that's exactly why I'm saying, like, the timing of it is just so poor. That's yeah. why I have a problem with Becky Lynch as a heel right now, because, like... <sighs> 
that's another story for another time. But WrestleMania X7. Yeah, and I will say that's a totally different thing because at least back then, WWE knew what they were doing. Right now, WWE can't even trade off championships without one girl wanting to rip the other girl's heads off. Yes, I brought that up. <laughs> Fucking Christ, that title swap. That's another topic for another time. But, uh, you know, I want to feel good. And we just talked about a phenomenal show, WrestleMania X7. This is a 10 out of 10 show for me. I don't know about you, Tomas. Same. But, yeah, Same. This Reliving is- it, this is 100% 10 out of 10 the greatest WrestleMania of all time. And there's nothing else that's going to come close to it. Never, never, never. Um, no. I mean, WrestleMania 19 definitely is probably number two to this, but I mean, this is the greatest pay-per-view of all time, you know, no question. And I think this is a perfectly fitting, you know, pay-per-view to have as this first audience poll for, you know, pay-per-view reviews. So thank you all so much for uh, voting this in. Cause it was a lot of fun to go back and relive. Um, oh yeah gonna, this was a lot more fun to review than crown jewel was yeah and uh honestly if tomas is up for it if you guys are up for it i'm more than game to put up some more polls up there for you guys to vote on and for pay-per-views to vote on retro pay-per-views i want to go back and look at some attitude era stuff i want to go back oh, and yeah. look at some old wcw stuff no but, uh, we kind of dropped the ball last a couple of weeks ago but we are going to look at deadly games that's going to be another fun one to watch while yep. we ethically debate about build it build up for survivor series yep survivor series the best of the best this year so definitely look out for reviews on that we got survivor series 1998 for a retro we got you know we're going to continue 2003 of course we got bad blood next up which is a great show the redneck uh, triathlon fuck the redneck triathlon <laughs> after stone cold steve austin's greatest wrestlemania achievement turning heel then you get the redneck triathlon to talk about on this channel great and you also have full gear not to mention you have aew to talk about so oh yeah, yeah. lots of stuff we're to gonna keep to. rolling along keep rolling 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 yeah Ro- no i'm not doing it right now but uh yeah <laughs> definitely hit that subscribe button if you want to keep up to date with all this content hit that thumbs up button as well that really really helps get this content out there uh we're on the road to 1000 subscribers here on the channel we're just going to keep chipping away at that thank you guys so much for your support tomas thank you so much again for coming on this is always a pleasure um and with all that being said guys commence that back talk see you guys in the next one <laughs>